and you're going to be looking directly at Mr. Galpin. Mm -hmm. Whenever you're ready, sir. All right. This is Joe Galloway mm -hmm. conducting an oral history interview with Mr. Alan Walsh on Monday, March 23rd at 1300 hours. We're located at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Sir, before we talk about your experiences in Vietnam, I'd like to get a little biographic information about you. How old were you when you went to Vietnam? Twenty. Twenty. Mm -hmm. Who were your family members? Uh, well, I was married. I got married in uh, eight months before I went over there. And, uh, and then, you know, I just, uh, my you know, folks lived in St. Petersburg, Florida, and my in-laws lived in upstate New York. And I had uh, two sisters and a brother. And All they were right. both, one sister's older than me and the others are younger. Uh, what did you consider your hometown? Uh, pretty much Rosendale, New York, just from very close to Woodstock, New York, the mm -hmm. infamous Woodstock, the Catskill Mountains. What was your sense of the Vietnam War before you decided to enter the military? You know, I, I, re I really never thought too much about the war politically, other than the fact that it was going on. Uh, I was looking forward to being in the service and participating in it, which probably sounded a little strange, but back then when people were avoiding the draft, I had, in, well, I ended up enlisting. But my whole family, all my uncles and and father and grandfather and all that, they were all prior military people. So I didn't, uh, I was just looking forward to joining some branch of the military and I actually enlisted in the Army when I only had two years of college because the Marines and the Navy and the Air Force wouldn't take me in flight school and the Army had the warrant officer program. So, I, and I didn't, it, it's kind of morbid and I probably would have looked at it a little bit differently after the fact, but. I didn't want to miss out on the war. I was kind of afraid it was going to wind down. And after I got there, I probably changed my mind a little bit. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you were a warrant officer. Yes, sir. And uh, what was, uh, how did you come to that? Uh, you enlisted? Yeah, it was, uh, he, uh, he spoke to Natural the recruiter and just told him why, you know, I wanted to fly. I, didn't, I had no interest in helicopters at all but I wanted uh, airplane flying as my career. And uh, the only way was to enlist in the Army, and he said if you know, took the tests, you could go in and go into Rotary Wing School, he says, and then after you get there, just apply for fixed wing school, and it would be no problem. And uh, so you went in as a listed man, you went through Fort Polk, Louisiana, with the you know, infantry training, and then graduating from there, you went to Fort Walters, Texas, primary flight school, and that's when I, well, I figured out in basic training that this wasn't going to work out the fixed wing thing because half the guys I talked to had the same exact plan. And uh, so when I got to Fort Walters, our class had 300 initial students in it and I think five fixed wing slots, which all went to guys that had fixed wing time and all that. So I ended up with helicopters, which was fine, but I mean that wasn't the, wasn't the plan. So then you have Fort Walters, Texas for 20 weeks was primary flight training. I came home, took two weeks leave, got married, and then went to Fort uh, Rucker, Alabama for the advanced training and the instrument rating in that, and then uh, became a warrant officer and a rated aviator. And then I got to go to Fort Sam Houston, Texas for their medical, they called medical field service training for uh, like an experimental medics course for pilots that lasted about four weeks. That was actually the best school I ever attended in the Army. Hmm. It was an excellent school. Never used any of the what I learned, but it was, it was excellent. Now, did you enlist because the draft was breathing down your neck or? No, well, no, I enlisted because I wanted to choose where I was going. I figured if I probably would get drafted, most people did at the time. This was before that lottery system came in, but uh, I just wanted to have my choice of what I wanted to do. And uh, so. When, when did you go to Vietnam? What date did you arrive? Uh, March 17th, St. Patrick's Day of 1970. Of 1970. Mm -hmm. What were your first impressions on landing? Uh, just before landing, it was, as you know, it's a long flight over there, there were multiple stop flights. It's almost 24 hours of, you know, getting on and off airplanes. 
but so you're pretty tired by the time you get there. And I think the first impression I had was in that Pan Am DC-8 uh, military charter that we're in and we're going into Benoit Air Base and probably about 5,000 feet I'm looking out of this little window and I'm looking down at this lush green countryside with smoke here and there and every once in a while you could see this green helicopter kind of down on the trees and it was almost surreal thinking that outside this window and I'm in clean clothes, there's flight attendants, we just ate a meal and I'm looking out at a war and I thought I, I just could not, I mean that was a I don't know, that was my first impression. I saw him looking through a window at a war below me. And then the door opened, and it was the reality of heat and humidity and interesting smells that I had, uh, whether it be defoliant smells or the burning jet fuel, which they used for the latrine wastes. And uh, it, it was unique. I've <laughs> probably never s smelt it since, but I know I'd recognize it if I smelt it again. What, what were your initial duties? Who were you assigned to? Uh, and, well, I, I had a choice when I got to the 90th replacement company. Uh, I was going to a medevac unit or a medical evacuation unit, and they, they gave us a choice of uh, going with the first cab to be met. They used the call sign medevac or go to a dust off unit. I didn't even know what dust off was or what the acronym meant. But all as I knew at that time is that dust off tended to fly in three and four core, and the terrain was flatter. And that sounded safer to me than being up in the mountains in the monsoon season. So I knew virtually nothing about the, the country at all. So I just chose the 45th Med Company, which was in Longbin, which was right next to Benoit. And that's where I stayed. That was your whole tour? Yeah, my whole tour, yes, sir. What was your daily routine? Uh, it was... Once we got checked out, which took seven or eight days because everything was so busy, they didn't have time to do your little in-country check ride. So we just sat around the officers' club, playing cards, drinking cokes, waiting to get you know checked in. Nobody would really talk to you, so you really didn't know what was going on. You just heard helicopters flying all day long. And uh, but once we got checked out, the normal routine was. You'd fly out of the company area, out of Long Bend. We had three aircraft stationed there, first up, second up, and third up. Uh, you'd do that for one or two days, and then you'd go out in the field for four and a half days. And then you came back, had one day off, and then... So you, you, you virtually flew six days on, one day off. And when you were out, you were on call 24 hours a day. So when you were out in the field, it was just... Which was actually... Uh, I, it was nice the way they did it because they gave you a your helicopter, you had your crew, your crew, you had two pilots, crew chief and medic. You went out and stayed in the fire base. We had standby sites throughout three and four corps. And uh, you just stayed out there. You lived in whatever accommodations they had. Sometimes it was a, just a sandbag bunker with mosquito nets. Sometimes it was actually wooden barracks. None of them had air conditioning or anything like that. But uh, you just stayed there. Or you, I don't think I ever took a shower because uh, it was really never running water or that. Uh, some of them had little mess halls, and if you're there during the eating hours, you get to eat. But we probably averaged on about one meal a day. I weighed a whole lot less than I do now. But, uh, and you were just, you, when, you, when you weren't flying, you would rest because you'd fly a couple missions, sit around a couple hours, fly a couple missions, and this would go on all day and all night. And uh, we were one of the only ones that flew at night routinely. We were very quiet on the radios at night, but, and that's what you did six days a week. So you're you're only socializing. You would do with you know, the members in your company was that one day back in Longbin. And Longbin was very civilized. That was a, a nice place to live. We actually had an air conditioner and an officers' club, and, and it, it was a very secure area. Uh, what events or responsibilities consumed most of your time? Uh, just flying the missions. That's that's pretty much all all you did. Um, at the end, I became a maintenance officer just because well, I had spent a little, bit, little time in the hospital, and uh, so it was something I could continue flying while I was recuperating. So that they, they checked me out as a maintenance test pilot my last month. So and I enjoyed I enjoy aircraft maintenance. I do still do today, but I don't do it. It's it's a hobby, but uh, so. So I added that to, and I was wanted to come back because I was going to make it a career. I wanted to come back and be a, a real uh, uh, 
an official maintenance officer, uh, which I never, never ended up doing because I got out. What were your impressions of the Vietnamese people initially and by the end of your tour? I thought about that a lot when I read that, that question. And, uh, and I know they changed. Uh, I know, and, and I don't know how long it was. I think we flew, since we, we flew for everybody, and mainly, we, we didn't work with many American troops at all. Uh, that would be rare. Most of our pickups were for Arvin troops. Um, some with the Australians, some with the Koreans, some with the Thais. Uh, the Arvins was the majority, and I can remember a lot of uh, comments being made that they just weren't your typical soldier. They, when things get bad, sometimes it was like, very easy to retreat and the advisors would look around and say, where are my guys? And they're headed back to the village. So, oh, and then if you were walking around, you know, you could get your pockets picked. It was like, I felt we were taken advantage of sometimes. And then about probably, you no know, halfway through my tour, I think I became a little more empathetic. I realized that I had a light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, I knew I could do this and it was a I mean, I had a good job, but it was crummy conditions. But it was only really over in a year. I may be coming back after a year, but I knew it would be over. And it dawned on me that these people probably were born, this is how they lived, and this is probably how their whole entire life, this was what it was. The, the crummy living conditions, uh, always some kind of war going on. They had nothing to look forward to. So I, my attitude towards them changed, I think, when I realized that. And, uh, and then the more, we did a lot of, carried a lot of civilians and like the, the injured children. And at first I got very callous toward it. You'd have the mother, you know, crying her heart out for her, her child. And it was like, we just did the job. We picked them up, we, we gave them everything we had, but uh, I became much more sensitive to that in the, in the last, at the end. And now since I've had kids, I don't know if I could go back and do that again. Tough. Very tough. Describe your impressions of your and friendships with your fellow soldiers. It's funny, you don't I don't think you realize until you're leaving the camaraderie that's developed uh, between these guys. I guess because of the job you're doing and what you would do for each other, hardly knowing these people. Um, but because we were separated from our company was big. We had 25 aircraft and 50 pilots. But because you were six or four and a half, almost five days out in the field, it was just you, your co-pilot, crew chief medic, and that was it. You never really got to socialize with all the guys in the unit. And uh, so you, you, you didn't have that team feeling like you might, I guess, with a, like a slick unit where you, you all flew missions together, and uh, but when you were leaving, that's when you realized how attached to these guys you had gotten. Uh, it was comforting to know that everybody, you kept your UHF radio always monitoring the UHF guard frequency. Uh, you knew that if you put out a mayday on that guard frequency, somebody that doesn't know you at all would do everything they can to come and get you and find you. And you would do the same. I mean, people would drop everything if they heard a call on, on guard. And uh, you know, I, don't like, I don't know if it's like that back here, but I mean, it's, it, it, was, it was just different. You did get attached to people you didn't really know that well. Yeah. Did you form friendships with men or women from different racial or social backgrounds during your time in Vietnam that you might not have had in civilian life? Not really, no. Everybody in my unit was pretty much a carbon copy of me, I guess. So, <laughs> they were all like yeah. you. What did you do on your day, one day off? Uh, had three meals because the mess hall was open and you could go to it. Uh, it was, you could, this was the one time of the week that you could drink beer if you wanted. It was only a nickel at the officer's club, but you had to fly the next day. So 
that one too, you know, such a good idea. Or you wouldn't feel very good the next day and find a helicopter in the heat after having a few beers probably the night before you know, you would have felt terrible. <laughs> so it, 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 it was, you know, it was pretty boring. And all you did was pretty much just write letters or go to the movie in the, uh, the officer's club that they had. And, uh, that, that was about it. Do you have any specific memory, memories of the American popular culture, music, books, film, etc., from that era? Uh, the only thing we knew about, well, the music, a lot of guys bought the stereo equipment that you could get inexpensively, and I can remember like Paul Revere and the Raiders and the Doors, and I'm so out of touch from some of that. But I think if even now today, if you hear some of that music, it triggers that time period. Uh, the uh, one movie that came out was, was brand new at the time that I saw in the Officers Club was the original version of MASH. And being that we were right next to that unit, that was, it was unique. Uh, uh, those are probably the two biggest things. What, was, what area of operations did you serve in? We covered, if you drew a line through the, like the middle of three core, south, almost to the bottom of four core. So up around like Tain Inn, by the Parrot's Beak of Cambodia, south, uh, you know, all the way down. So it's in the bottom half of three core and the most of four core. Can you describe significant actions that you wish witnessed or combat operations in which you participated? Uh, that's kind of what we were talking about before, that we, I mean, we just, if, if, if the unit was doing some particular operation, and we would just get called in to pick up the wounded pass. We had no idea what their goal was, if they were attacking or trying to take over the top of a mountain. All as we did was pick up their patients and take them out of there. The only one I specifically remember is when we went into Cambodia, and that lasted for about five days before I think Congress put a stop to that. You know, I guess they didn't, Washington didn't know about it, or but it was a big move into Cambodia up by uh, Tain in, and we flew a lot. It was continuous, and I, I, we had a temporary base at a place called Song Bay, right, right near the big mountain, uh, Nui Ba Din Mountain. Uh, and that was the only time in the entire war where I actually thought we, we, we were doing some good as far as fighting a war. We were the aggressor. Uh, a lot of people were getting hurt. I've seen them take a hundred people off a of Chinook at Makwa, uh, South Vietnamese soldiers that were dead. But the the uh, the American soldiers were like gung ho soldiers because they thought we're finally up there doing something and we're winning. And then it came to a screeching halt in five days, and we went back to the normal thing of take the mountain and then leave the mountain, and give it back. What were your emotions at that time? No different, I think, than they were the entire time I was there. You just, you just did, you just, you just flew. You did your, you did your job, and uh, uh, you do every. You, you, it was nobody more important than the next guy, and it didn't matter whether it was a civilian or a U.S. soldier. Uh, what was your most vivid memory of Vietnam? Uh, as far as like a particular event or something that uh, stands out, there's a lot of there's a lot of thing. One uh, to me, the, the 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 weather was kind of the biggest issue since we weren't combat forces. Uh, I think, you know, I think most people tend to think, well, when you went out, I mean, you were exposed to gunfire and all that, which, is, which was very rare. Uh, but the weather, to me, during that six months, during the monsoon season, was probably the biggest problem and the one particular event that nobody liked to fly too much in the mountains because we were flatland Delta pilots. Uh, I was out in a place called Swan Lock, and it was real mountainous out there. We carried a hoist. Very few aircrafts carried hoists, but when you're in the the mountains you did. And uh, at night, you, you'd seem to 
fly up the most, and when the weather was bad, it seems like that's when people would get hurt. But I did do a hoist mission in the mountains at night. Night hoists are particularly challenging. And uh, I did one, the gunships couldn't get out there because of the weather. I was able to get out there. The hoist itself was was very memorable. It was it was extremely difficult. We finally got the two guys out of the jungle. We run along and fuel, flew down to a place called Hamtam, which is on the, the coast with South China Sea to refuel. And then I hovered back to a fire support, a fire support, support base called Mace, which it seemed to be about 40 miles, hovering between the trees on a highway because it was raining and the clouds were down in the trees. Uh, it might have, it might not, have, it might have been 20 miles. It just seemed to get, take for absolute ever. And it was constantly like going in and out of vertigo with all the rain on the windshield. We didn't go more than about 20 or 30 knots. Uh, nobody ever shot at us because they were probably trying to stay dry. But uh, that was probably the most nerve wracking night that I ever had. And then we finally got the patient back to the 93rd back hospital a long bit. But that was from, went on from about like two in the morning to five in the morning. Wow. But, Describe for me the best day you had during your Vietnam service. I can't think of any day that was 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 great. Um, the enjoyable days, because that's all we did was fly. I mean, it was you, you just fly or sat around waiting to fly. But then at nighttime, when it was a full moon and it was clear, that was actually enjoyable. You felt like you were an airline pilot. You'd see the lights. Um, you know, I remember landing at Benoit Air Base, going down the runway, and helicopter didn't need a runway, but we did anyway because it was there, and I, because I wanted to be an airline pilot, I thought this was the closest I'd ever come. But that was probably the, the nicest flying that I ever did. Describe for me the worst day you had during your Vietnam tour. I think it was that day in Swanlock, doing doing that that hoist mission. I got shot down a couple of times, but that happened so quick, and. We were successfully rescued. That uh, it, it really wasn't. It, it really wasn't all that bad, uh, to me. The, the the weather problems and the mountains and all that was was worse. How much contact did you have with our allies, the Koreans, Thais, Filipinos, Aussies, New Zealanders? The uh, I worked with all of them. Uh, I mean, I worked with, I flew missions for them. Uh, the only ones we actually lived with out in the field with the Australians down at a place called Nui Dot, down near Vung Tau. Yeah. And uh, they were some of the greatest people. Well, you know what, I remember them telling them they had to extend their time in the service in order to get the chance to go to Vietnam. We didn't have much choice, but they, these people loved the job they were doing. Their attitudes were uh, terrific. I mean, everything to them was like a, they were on a big game hunt. It was really <laughs> enjoyable. The Koreans were probably the best as far as the fiercest fighting people that I've ever worked with. Very regimented. Uh, when they told you an area was secure, it was secure. They, I mean, they they were tough. The uh, the Arvins were you know, so so. The New Zealanders, I. It, they, there was very few of them. The ties were probably the weakest as far as if the area to them was secure, it meant there hadn't been anybody within 20 yards. Um, and it was usually communications problems. And, but, but the Australians were, were probably the nicest guys to work with. They enjoyed their job. How much contact did you have with your family back home? Other than writing to my wife, which I did probably every other day, that was it. Never made one phone call. Making a phone call was so difficult, and you went through so much, these different operators, until you finally got to an American operator that made the, finally made the final phone call, and then you got disconnected somewhere along the line. So I never made, in, in the year that I was there, never made one phone call home. That was successful. I tried it like twice. and. Uh, uh, so how did you communicate with your family? Your letters? Just letters, and I probably I'm not good at writing. They didn't have spell check then or any of that, so my writing was was poor. I mean, I write to my wife just because it would I I catch all havoc if I didn't. But I that was maybe every other day. I don't think I wrote home to my 
mom and dad maybe once a month. I mean, I wasn't really good, I wasn't really good at that. <laughs> How much news did you receive about the war from home? None from home. Uh, we pretty much just learned what was really going on, like through Stars and Stripes, you know, the, the newspaper. Uh, AFVN. AFVN, a little bit. That was what the ADF radio was used for because we couldn't navigate with it, so they, you could listen to AFVN. And, but, uh, uh, it's, you know, I think I learned more through the Stars and Stripes newspaper about what was going on in the war than anything else. Were you aware of any particular political or social events or movements back in the States? I remember reading about the Woodstock, uh, whatever you call that, that festival. And, uh, and I grew up 28 miles from Woodstock, but the actual festival really wasn't wasn't there, it was supposed to be, but it ended up being down on the Pennsylvania border on a farm. But I did remember seeing it, and I, I can remember comment to, to, commenting to my, uh, my roommate, you know, you're, you're looking at all these, I guess the hippies back then, and they're rolling, it was, it was muddy, and they were, they were doing their drugs, and they were just rolling around. It looks like they're having a good time, and I thought, you know, I volunteered to do this, and I'm rolling around in the mud too, but they're having a lot better time than I am, so <laughs> maybe they had the right idea after all. I mean, it was in jest, but uh, I still felt when I came back I, I did the right thing, and I'd probably do it again anyway, so. When did you return home? Uh, St. Patrick's Day of 1971. What, what was that trip like? Uh, that was probably the biggest surprise to me of my entire time in Vietnam is from the day we got there, we're counting off to the days we come home. And we made this, uh, my roommate and I made this big calendar with the covered with acetate and you get to X off a day. Uh, and if you were out in the field, which was great, you got back, you got to X off five days. I mean, it was like making a leap ahead. And we did this for the entire, and ever, whoever got back in the field first got to X the days off. So it was a big event. And you thought all the time of what it's going to be like coming home. I mean, setting foot in San Francisco again, for, you know, it, that's all, you know, you thought about that every day. Uh, and the day came when we went to leave, well, because most of our crews were out in the field, there's no going away party or, or anything. You just, most, everyone was gone. I mean, the, the company area was, was, was pretty, you know, bleak. So when, when it came time to leave, you just turned in your, your M16 and your 38 and your body armor and your helmet and packed up your duffel bag and you left. There was no party, no nothing. I don't even remember the commanding officer saying goodbye to us. He must have. And we went over to the 90th replacement company where Pan Am jet comes back and for sitting there for an entire year waiting for this day we finally go to get on the airplane and I walked up the steps there's 199 of us and I walked up the steps of that ex external steps of the airplane I turned around and looked back <laughs> excuse me it was like I didn't want to leave and I would have never if you told me I'd feel like that at any time during the year I said well you're crazy maybe you'll feel that way but I'm leaving just as soon as I get the chance. I'm going to do my job. And I turned around and I felt like I needed to go back. Strange. And we had talked about it because the guy who was my roommate turned out to be the guy sitting next to me coming home in the airplane. We left the exact same day. We figured, well, when that airplane breaks ground, there'll probably be applause. There'll be cheering. That airplane left, broke ground, and there wasn't a sound. It was really weird. Uh, it was dead silent. That was the quietest trip coming home. And I, I would have never, never expected that. Hmm. What was your reception like on the other end? Uh, there really wasn't any. Uh, as you know, I mean, that was one of the uh, <clears throat> most of the, it was very unpopular, you know, war. So when you got home, uh, there was your home. Uh, when we got to, because we started off, I was on, I was living in New York, so when I got home, really was Travis Air Force Base, and then they bust us over to Oakland to, to the, I guess there's an Army station there in Oakland. It was, uh, it's kind of a blur. I'm, it seemed to me it was nighttime when we did this, we did all the paperwork. I do remember coming home feeling like 
uh, I've got some more stories to tell. I mean, this is, I mean, I, I was, I was you know, proud of surviving. I was proud of what we did. I flew 1,400 missions. I figured, well, I'm 21 years old. I was an aircraft commander. I mean, I, I, uh, I really felt good about what I had accomplished. And when you got home, it's like nobody cared, really. They didn't even really want to hear about it. Uh, nobody asked. They were very polite. Now, I didn't run into any problem with the baby killer thing or being spit on. Or I mean, people were polite, except at Oakland, the, we were standing in line at a, a mess hall, and some young enlisted guys that hadn't been in the service very long at all, they come running and pushing and kind of pushed ahead of us in line, and I'm thinking, geez, I, I thought we did demanded a little more respect. I mean, I had some medals on, you know. I had, I had some the Vietnam service ribbon. And it was, you know, there was really, nobody really seemed to care too much. And then after that, we got processed. Then I took the you know, commercial flight back to uh, New York City, took the bus up, and my wife met me at the bus stop. And it was, it was just her. And uh, I saw my friends. I was the only one of my group of friends that I grew up with that went in the military. And they were, they were real nice to me, but nobody, because I mean, I, I, I remember coming back and says, man, I got some real no shit war stories. I mean, this is, you're not going to believe what, what we do. And nobody really wanted to know. And I didn't volunteer it. It was like, well, hey, did you see so-and-so got a new Mustang? Or, you know, so-and-so college is playing football. And that to me was, it was kind of a real letdown. I mean, I didn't begrudge the fact that they didn't go in the service, but it was like nobody cared what you did. Yeah. Uh, How much contact have you had with uh, fellow veterans over the years? Very little. That fellow that I did ride back in the plane where we were roommates, he today manages my IRA. I mean, he went and got a real job. He got out of the flying business and became a financial planner. And I still see him every year. Uh, he lives up in Minnesota, in the Minneapolis area. Uh, and every year or two, the 45th, it's called, the, we have a, it's our little own organization called the, uh, the, the 40th or the Dust Off Association. And uh, you, we try to get together once a year, once every two years. It's a small group. It's probably 10 or 12 guys that are left. Uh, but that's that's about it. Was it difficult for you to readjust to life after the war? Mm, not at all. No, I, because I used, I, I I mean, I didn't just join the military to do my patriotic duty. I mean, I had kind of another motive. I wanted to get married. I wanted to get married ever since I was in the tenth grade, and I did marry the girl, and she's still home now. But. Uh, I, you know, had no real job, and I only had a year and a half of college. So, you know, the military, being a military officer, even as a warrant officer, the pay grades were pretty much the same as a second lieutenant, first lieutenant. So I could afford to be married. Plus, when I got out, I had the GI Bill. So I used it to my advantage, and I knew that ahead of time. I mean, if I give them their time in the service, they'll give me the education. So to me, it was worth the risk. And that's what I did. I ended up using the GI Bill, get my four-year degree. I went to work for Delta Airlines for the last 33 years, and I did just what I wanted to do. So it was an odd way of getting there, going as an enlisted man up, but it worked. Is there any memory or experience from your service in Vietnam that has stayed with you through the years and had a lasting influence on your life? There's a lot of uh, memory. Most of them are most of them are good, uh, but I do probably my year in Vietnam had more impact on my life than anything that I've ever done, ever. I mean, not bad, but it's like you you think about it off and on two or three times a week, just little things. I mean, and you you'll just remember. And it's not not the bad things. There was. Uh, the the injuries and, and stuff that you're exposed to daily, you did get used to it. I never thought I would, and you did. And it doesn't it doesn't come back to haunt me. Uh, it was just a, a a very maturing experience. I mean, I I came back. I thought one of the funniest 
and I bring this up a, a lot because it was one of the, the most comical things that I came across, is I was a brand new aircraft commander, which I had all of 90 days of experience, and they made me an aircraft commander. And within a month, I got shot down for the second time. But the first time shot down as an aircraft commander, where I was in charge of the crew and supposed to know what to do when you hit the ground. I didn't know anything about what to do on the ground. <laughs> and uh, But the people look up to, okay, boss, what are we going to do now? <laughs> I says, well, <laughs> and you have to act like you know what you're doing. And uh, But we ended up getting picked up, and it, it all, all worked out fine. And uh, we got home, Well, when we got... They, Eventually got a ride back to Long Bend. We left the aircraft out there. And uh, my roommate, who's the same guy from Minneapolis, he was there to meet us as we landed. He was not out in the field then. And uh, he was a scotch drinker. And when we landed, we got off and we're all full of the mud and, and, and stuff. But yeah, everyone was okay. And he says, take your shower. We're going to go down to the PX. And we're going to buy a bottle of Cuddy Sark scotch. And we're going to drink that whole thing tonight. And uh, I thought, well, that sounds good to me, because I was still on the adrenaline from the, what had just gone on. So I get cleaned up. We go to the PX, and he buys the scotch. And as you know, things were very, very cheap over there. It, it didn't cost but a couple of dollars. And he was checking out, and I says, let me pay for this. I says, I can afford it. I took out my ration card and had nothing, no cigarettes checked off, no beer, wine. I says, I can, I can use my ration card. And I went to pay for it. And the lady, the little Vietnamese girl, checked us out. She says, I'm sorry, sir, I cannot sell this to you. And I says, why not? And she says, you're not old enough. <laughs> I was 20. And I, 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 that, that caught me. I was so surprised. I says, there's a war going on outside. I says, there's a drinking age over here? I didn't. I said, I'm not even old enough to vote, and there's a drinking age. And I'm the aircraft commander of this you know, half million dollar helicopter, and I'm not old enough to drink. I thought that was so absurd, and so Tom ended up paying for it. And I don't like scotch anyway, so. You, but I you just got thought, your half of it. Yeah, yeah. I just thought it was unique that the, that's what the responsibilities they'll give you at such a young age. Did your Vietnam experience affect the way you think about veter our veterans who are returning from combat today? Probably so. I think that they're, I think they, I think we've, the public has learned from that and they, they treat them better and, 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 and give them credit for what they've done. So it, it, it's, it's turned out right. And I don't, I don't hold any resentment over what went on because, like I say, it was a means to an end for me. I got the GI Bill out of it, got my time, and it worked. So, but some people do. Uh, How do you think the Vietnam War is remembered in our society today? I don't know if it really is. I don't talk to really anybody at all. I mean, it never, it never comes up, unless you're with a group of, you know, old guys like myself. It, it doesn't come up. It was interesting down at Noonan High School. We had the two helicopters down there last week. Those kids were interested in it, but they're studying it. Yeah. And if they weren't studying it, they probably wouldn't even know where Vietnam was. Uh, Did you take away from Vietnam more that was positive and useful than you invested in blood, sweat, and tears? I think I did. I think I, I think I, uh, like I said before, I think I matured a lot, uh, and it to me it wasn't all bad. Politically, we could talk about whether we should have been there or not, but that. But as far as I, I have no ill will of anything I did. I'm, I was very fortunate, too, to get to have the job I had. Uh, you know, I, I, I picked up, we were roughly estimated about 4,000 patients over that year. Some of those people probably are alive today just because they were, they were medevaced out. And uh, so I, I have nothing, I've got good feelings. I had a good job. I thought it would be neat to fly a Cobra and blow things up, and that was fun in flight school. But I think I feel a lot better about the job I did because Though the war didn't go too well, the part that I did did. What lessons did you take from Vietnam that you would like to pass on to future generations of Americans? Don't get into a war that you don't plan on winning. <laughs> you know, fight it, fight it right, and and, and you know, fight to win and leave. I'm, I'm not sure we we learned that too well, but. 
Have you been to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in D.C.? I was when it first, kind of, probably in the first year it was up there. What were your impressions when you visited there? It's kind of a very solemn place. The, the, the black wall, the quiet, it's just, uh, I didn't know, fortunately, I knew very few of the names on there. I don't think it was a handful, and some of them were people I, I just knew from flight school. So it wasn't that I could look at a bunch of names that I knew personally, but it was just a very solemn atmosphere. Have you heard about the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam War commemoration? Just last week when they did the thing at the high school. What are your thoughts about this? I guess it's it's good that we it does re get recorded and people are made aware of you know what happened. I you know, whether people really care I don't know because there's other things there's a lot worse things happening right now. Um, I, uh, I I don't dwell on it like I say for me it was it, it was almost kind of a, a positive thing because it it worked out for me and I came. My attitude probably be a whole lot different, but when we, my roommate and I talked, when we were leaving, our goal was to leave, but it was also to leave with all our fingers and toes and, and parts. You know, that, you know, there was a lot of people that came home alive that had a lot of other physical problems or mental problems, so, and that all worked out for us. Now, if something like that didn't, I'm, my attitude might be different, but I was, I was fortunate, and uh, I would do it again, I think, if, if given the, you know, if, if the, if it came up again. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. No, thank you. I'm, I was a co-pilot, and it, that's kind of like, uh, you really don't know what's going on. You're just along, filling up the seat. And it was uh, in the mountains right along, right by bunk up working with the Australians. And, uh, we are just making a pickup up in the mountain. The performance of a helicopter up in the mountains is, is poor, especially in hot days. And uh, we were you know, hovering on the side of a hill. We had the skid into the side of the hill. The rotor blades were almost hitting the hill. It was so steep. And we started loading the people from the low side of the helicopter, which was really difficult because it was a long way down. And we started taking fire in the Australian gunship. It was just a Yui with guns on it. You know, he, well, he told us, oh, well, everyone they deserted us. They just hit the ground. It wasn't Australia's. It was South Vietnamese, but there was Australian advisors. They wouldn't load the patients anymore, so we had to leave because they got down behind the rocks. And that worked out. We got back out, dropped our one, one or two guys off that we had. We came back, went to the exact same place, and the exact same thing happened the second time. And you couldn't hear the gunfire, but I saw dirt kicking up in front of the chin bubble, and then I felt thump. Thump, and you can actually feel it hitting the side of the aircraft, and uh, and then the crew, then the crew chief behind me, he took around his chicken plate, so he was hollering, uh, and I don't, th I'm not sure if we we did get a bunch of patients on board. I don't know if we got them all, but we had to leave, and when we and we had to go right past. The, it's the only time in my life I saw the guy who was shooting. He was dug into the side of a hill, and he had this kind of a 30 caliber or a light machine gun, and he was shooting. And fortunately, he must have thought a UE could accelerate faster than it does, because we're trying to go, and it was like 20 knots, 30 knots, 40 knots. And the tracers were crossing right in front of Lee. He led us all the way out and led us too far the entire way out of the valley, never took another hit. And we made it to the, but the whole helicopter was rocking. We made it to the beach. The Australian uh, gunship landed behind us. He didn't circle. He just went ahead, and we didn't know it. He's landed right behind us on the beach. and. Uh, and their attitude was, well, we had lost a transmission mount. Was, the round had gone through, so the whole transmission was rocking, and things, a lot of fluids were leaking. And he gets very calmly on the radio. He says, hey, dust off, in his Australian accent. He says, you might not want to get out. <laughs> I says, well, what, because we were going to get out and get in with him and leave. And he says, we're in a, a friendly minefield. <laughs> and he oh. says, we don't have the map for it. And it's nothing's blown up yet, but no one wants to walk around. So that we figured, well, a helicopter's still running. And it was rocking a little bit, but it was still running, and we had a, the pressures and temperatures were right. So we flew it down to Bong Tao at about 100 feet down the South China Sea around the beach. And it was, wasn't that far. I mean, it was maybe 20 miles. So uh, we made it out. The, the second time I was, like I said, I was the 20-year-old new aircraft commander teaching a, 
my co-pilot, his brand new, two weeks in country, uh, young fella, and I was teaching him how to do a tactical approach to a secure pickup site. It was just 10 patients to pick up. I remember it was clear as day, it was one mile east of Ben Trey and a fork in the Mekong River. And uh, it, pretty low trees and palm trees and that. And uh, it was an Arvin unit, and they had, it was a command detonated Claymore mine. And they said, but there was no enemy contact at all. And we did booby trap pickup all the time. And they were just, you rarely got shot at. You just went and you picked them up. But you always planned that you would. So I was showing this guy how to do a tactical approach. One of these things where you slow way down, dive into the trees, then low level up through the treetops for the last two miles. But I was just doing them to teach him how to do it because we really didn't have to. And I flew right over top of bad guys. And they just were shooting straight up into this, the, the you know, bottom of the aircraft, but it flooded it with JP-4. I mean, it was, there was fuel oil all over the inside of the aircraft, and I made it. All I was going for is the purple smoke. I saw that, and I said, I decided I would never be a POW, so we're going to crash. We're going to crash where the good guys are. And it, it ran long enough, made it to the purple smoke, kind of came through the trees. It stayed upright, and it, it hit the ground. Actually, made a nice landing out of it, shut it down, and we bailed out of the thing right away. Well, the Arvins don't know this happened because all that happened two miles away and they start because they've been told to load that aircraft as fast as possible they start loading the patients on it when we run away from the helicopter i think it's going to burn and uh we turn around and there they are as fast as they can loading these 10 injured guys on and my crew chief he was a big stocky guy he went around the other side and he's grabbing them and he's throwing them back out, and they're going faster, and he's throwing them out fa as fast as, and they're probably thinking these Americans are crazy. They're really crazy. And uh, finally, when well, I'm pointing to those, nobody spoke. Then I then I realized the guy I was talking to on the radio was in the town of Bentre, a mile a mile away. It was through an interpreter, so there was nobody that spoke English, and so communications was a problem. They're walking around in the open. They have no idea there's bad guys out there, and. Uh, and you know, fuel. And that, that's when I end up with my only war injury. Is I, I look and underneath the helicopter was this soldier that was full of frag wounds and all his JP4s running onto his legs. And I figured this has got to hurt. And I reached under to, to pick him up, and I felt something kind of rip. And I said, "Well, that felt kind of funny." And that's when I learned about what a hernia was. Oh. <laughs> so that uh, that was you don't get purple hearts for that out of a bike, but. Uh, no combat, no, no. no combat record for hernia. Huh? No, I didn't even ask. It was kind of an embarrassing thing. It says, you know, it's. That's great. But, uh, but that was that, that was it. That uh, thank most you, of most thank of you it very was routine. Much, sir. Well, I guess I got to give you back this.